talking with Harold Steele on the occasion of his uh, investiture into the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. Quite an honor for many Illinoisans, and certainly one that uh, uh, we feel you're richly deserving of. The uh, Lincoln Academy is quite an honor, isn't it? Indeed it is. I had, uh, through the years, attended a couple of other academies, uh, and the audience, little did I ever suspect that I would be one of the recipients. And uh, I was certainly impressed with the methodologies carrying out this very unique program here in Illinois. And it makes you even feel better when Abraham Lincoln's name is attached and is a centerfold and is the focal point of the program. And I, I, had, I think that the officials in Illinois that instigated this program are to be recognized and honored for their intuition and the purpose of the academy. And uh, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we, we were honored and you feel good. Now, we're on your farm here in Bureau County. It's not too far away from where you were born, is it? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I was, I've always lived here. My folks moved into this particular house from down the road, which was now we call the tenant house. And uh, my mother decided and told my dad that they were going to go up to Lee County for my birth. I was the first one in the family to go to this particular little hospital. Actually, it was two houses put together with a a breezeway between Dr. Angier up in Sublet, Illinois. So, but I've always lived here on this farm in this house, and um, as my father always lived on this far farm. My great grandfather bought the original 80 acres back in 1873, but he was not a farmer. He was a storekeeper in the village of Dover. Was there ever any mystery that uh, that you might uh, become a farmer, or is that always something that uh, uh, pretty much a sure bet? A sure bet from the very beginning. I, that's what I wanted to do. And I had two brothers, and we all grew up on a farm. We all participated. My oldest brother, in fact, farmed a number of years before he retired from the farm. My youngest brother uh, chose another avenue. What do you love about farming? I guess a good bit like my dad, the spring of the year, to see everything come to life. And you, you plant the crops. You watch them grow. You wish it would rain, and then you wish it would stop raining. But you see the creation develop. And then in the fall, you harvest. And everything goes to sleep for the winter. But as I grew up on the farm, the marketplace determined what we were going to receive for the crop. The competitive enterprise system was really in my blood because it was in my dad's blood and his father's blood. And this causes you to skirmish and think and plan and manage. But now there's a great change in this. And we're seeing that the competitive enterprise system on the farm is disseminating rapidly. Vertical integration is causing, to me, a severe problem, an unconscionable problem an unfair problem, and I'm really disheartened to the fact that we're seeing the marketplace jerked out from underneath the farmers and they're going to become a labor force. I think it's a, a, it's a terrible thing, not only for the largest enterprise in America, agriculture, but it's a terrible thing for the ultimate user, the consumer, and we're doing in our society, nothing about it. And I happen to believe that our forefathers, as they drew up the Constitution, as they drew up the other documents so important to our society, I believe our lawmakers are turning their heads the other way to agriculture. Why is that? Well, as Earl Butts, the former Secretary of Agriculture, would have said, the vertical integrators have greased the skids. They've greased the skids, and the heads that should be looking to this are turning the other way. To me, this is far different than mom and pop's grocery, mom and pop's drugstore. This is an enterprise that has proven through the years to be infallible, and now we're seeing it just destroyed. 
How has it changed over the years since you entered farming as a young man? It didn't change. You know, I farmed on my own after World War II. But up until World War II, I was part of the enterprise here as a family operation. You know, we three boys and my two sisters would enter into the activity of production and processing of, of the foods that were produced here. You milk the cows and feed the cattle and the hogs and gather the eggs for the chickens and so forth. That was a, a self-contained unit. And you'd take the eggs that you didn't use and the cream that you didn't use on a Saturday night into town and barter it for oatmeal and sugar and coffee and so forth. Even though it was a business then, it was a way of life, now it's a business an absolute business in this part of the United States. And you specialize. But now many of these specializations are in a contract. You don't go to the marketplace, it's in a contract. You don't make management decisions, they're in the contract. You're told what to do. And uh, I'm definitely opposed to it. Is there any, um, is there any formula for changing that though? Well, I have some papers from some of the uh, professors at certain land-grant colleges, and they have several special things that say need to be studied directly and quickly, and these are specific areas. Ohio State, Missouri, I haven't seen anything from Illinois, and I'm disappointed. When getting back to the... At Purdue, got to mention Purdue, Purdue too. Mm -hmm. They're boom right here. Mm -hmm. You were, uh, you went to the University of Illinois. I did. Mm -hmm. World War II intervened. I did. Mm -hmm. You saw a lot I of- I finished three years, and all of our class that were in advanced military uh, went into active duty at the end of our junior year. You saw a lot of combat in, in Patton's Army. It's in the 3rd Army, 89th Division, infantry. Yes, we did. We, uh, we didn't hit the, we didn't hit it on D-Day. We came in later, right at the Bulge the end of the bulge. We are heading for the bulge, but our artillery wasn't there, so we were delayed. That's where my uncle was rolled up in the bulge. Yeah. He was with the Golden Lions, I believe. Yeah. We crossed the Moselle or the Mosel River and the Rhine River, and our outfit had to be the first one to take over a concentration camp, Udruf. Didn't know a thing about these camps. Didn't know a thing about how they were, they were burying people and annihilating people and starving people and burning them. There it was. That must have been, uh, uh, for anyone, for anyone, a horrifying revelation to come across something like that and see what was being done. We had no idea. And I was maybe a quarter of a mile. Our platoon happened to be in the lead position. And uh, we heard ma German machine gun fire up ahead in this cluster of buildings and trees. And so we were there shortly thereafter, and out in the quadrangle were the, what they believe were the last inmates to be machine gunned down. Some fortunately survived it and hidden. But here were huge dugout places with the remains sprinkled with white lime, stacks of bodies, horrible thing. And you know, our Regimental commander got a hold of the division commander. He in turn got a hold of General Patton. General Patton called General Eisenhower, and they were right there. And our order from General Eisenhower was, get every citizen from this town of Gotha, G-O-T-T-A, Gotha. Force them to walk through here and see what has been going on. You could tell from their faces that most of them had no idea of what was going on. That night, the mayor committed suicide. What do you say to the people today who are trying to write the revisionist histories that said, well, nothing quite like that on the scale of that ever happened. There may have been a few incidents here and there, but it wasn't really as bad as all that. You know, it's a tragedy. It is a tragedy that so many of the media people are permitted to say what they want to say and create their own studies as compared to reporting the facts to the people. That's the way it used to be. You know, you asked me a question, how did agriculture used to be? 
It used to be at that same time, too. We believe the ministers, the guy, the clergy. You believe the judge. You believe the teacher. And you minded these people. But you also believe what you read and heard from the media. To me, this is one of the greatest tragedies in our country. Of those people who knowingly create what they want the people to hear. You came back to the United States after the, the war. You were decorated. You were wounded in battle. Um, came back to this farm? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, started a family here and uh, became a successful farmer in your own right. Uh, so I've done some reading. You uh, uh, became active in the Farm Bureau. Tell me about your first affiliation with that organization because you have a long, long history with it. Could I interrupt one thing? Yeah, of course. You know, there's one other thing that I brought back to the farm other than the desire to farm, and that was a new wife. Sure. We met overseas during occupation. Uh, I was in Vienna, Austria. I was chief agent criminal investigation U.S. forces in Austria. And I met on a blind date this nice brunette from New York City. Dover, Illinois, population 200, New York City. And I just really liked her from the very beginning, and within three months, we were married. Now, she tells me it was four months, but three or four months, we were married. Here she was from New York City. Now, my dad, as true with most of us farmers, really didn't spend a lot of time writing letters, but he wrote a nice letter to his new daughter-in-law. He said, Dear Marjorie, now, I know you're from New York City, and I know you're a little apprehensive about coming here to the farm. But I want you to know, on a real dark night, you can look up to Dover and see it's one light. <laughs> so you see, she, she is the one that really made the adjustment. I came back home. And because she and I lived across the street from the NKVDs, the Russian-Soviet counterintelligence people in the Army, because she had spent time in North Africa, as a cryptographer with the OSS that became the CIA. We had a common bond of pride of country and feeling an obligation to do what we could outside of the industry of agriculture. And I believe fervently, probably from my father and mother, that Farm Bureau was the organization that spoke for and worked in behalf of the farmer members. Dad was active here in the county in Farm Bureau. Mother was active in Home Bureau. So I suppose that's what instilled me to say, here's a place where I should be able to do something to help agriculture. And Marjorie, because of her background and because of the bond that we had created because of where we lived following our marriage, was very supportive because a lot of this burden fell upon her here to farm. Then we had a son. One son, fortunately, he liked to farm. If it hadn't been for Greg, I couldn't have spent the time with Farm Bureau either. What does the Farm Bureau do? Legislative, marketing, uh, information, basic ingredients that farmers need. They're the lookout point. When I was with Farm Bureau in, in Bloomington, the state organization, we, as we talked as staff and as we talked as a board of directors that set policy, we have a responsibility to give heads up to the members about what's coming down the road, what they should look for, because we felt we were in a position to really know what's coming. They are busy producing and selling. It was our responsibility not only looking after their current needs that they realize, but also what's coming over the hill, what's coming down the road, what's coming ahead of them. Quite likely, they wouldn't be in a position to know we should have been. How did you start to rise through the ranks in the organization? Well, one day, I was right over there, the other side of the house. And a neighbor from across the creek, Dutch Pearson, lived about three and a half miles from here, came in. It so happened that my mother, who was a one-room school teacher, teaching eight grades, the young lady, that Dutch was one of her students. I always called him level-headed. He, he, he chewed tobacco at that time a little bit, came out of each side. Dutch came in, and he said, your turn. 
I said, what do you mean it's my turn? Well, he said, I have been representing Dover Township on the county board. I'm going to retire. Now you do it. It's your turn. That's the way it started. So I became a candidate and was selected uh, on a county board. You worked your way up in politics. You worked your way up in the uh, Farm Bureau. You became president of the Illinois Farm Bureau in 1970? Yes. And served 13 years in that post. Yes. You saw a lot of changes and a lot of different programs initiated, uh, active in a lot of uh, legislative activities. Um, let's talk about some of that, property tax uh, reform and farmland assessment reform. Why is that so important to the farmer? At the time that we were working on this particular issue, we had a tax structure of personal property tax as well as land tax. And the land tax was based and responsible for local government, such as the school system, the fire departments, the roads, and all of the local taxing districts. And we knew that under that formula that we'd been using, that as properties went up in value with inflation and other factors, that the land tax per acre were going to be abnormally high. And so our staff worked with University of Illinois people and others, including the current dean of the College of Agriculture. Dave Chequin did a tremendous job in formulating a kind of system, a kind of formula that would keep land taxes a fair market value. It was a formula not only of the escalated value of the land, but also the value of the commodities harvested and sold from that land and we did away with property taxes. That is personal property. There was also the removal of sales tax on farm equipment? It was, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's still true. Those are major issues for farmers. I also know that you did a lot of work on market development, not only for domestic uh, markets for Illinois products, but you were always taking the long view towards the overseas markets as well. Yes, we knew that as we became more proficient in productivity that we're going to produce far more than the domestic market could possibly handle. So we knew that one of two things had to happen. Cut back production or open markets. And we knew that just like in the Army, the worst thing you can do is a holding force or retreat. The best thing to do is surge ahead, advance ahead. The same is true with agriculture. You don't want to say cut back production. You don't want to say do a poor job. Do the best you can. Increase it, and we'll find a market. And that's what we try to do. You were uh, instrumental in working on, uh, you made trips to uh, the former Soviet Union uh, and saw the potential for crops there, for markets there, uh, fought the Soviet grain embargo of the uh, 1980s. Yeah. Um, talk about Even that. Even in the 70s. 70s. You know, we've had several presidents that have used food as a tool. And that tool was to a disadvantage to the farmers. You can't do that. We also knew that during several international agreements, GATT agreements, that agriculture was not used with the same equal force as other commodities and other produce. And we've done away with both of them. They have, the presidents have stopped using food as a tool and in GATT negotiations, food is used as a negotiating principle, the same as the others. Mm -hmm. You did a lot of, uh, a lot of work on uh, uh, getting farmers politically active in those days as well. Um, was, that, uh, was that a particularly tough challenge to get people uh, uh, involved in getting into the politics, going to their representatives and their state senators' offices? Across the board, yes, and it still is today. People, for some reason, do not want to do this. And it's not unusual, and I say this with a disheartened heart, it's not unusual for parents to say to their children, do not become involved in politics, as if it's a horrible place to be. The word a bureaucrat is used with discriminatory comments, but negativism. And I would say, we need the brightest, sharpest people in politics. It should be an honor to serve your country, not a dishonor. 
It should be an honor to work with your political leaders. But also, the strongest part of our country is not in Washington. The strongest part of our country is not in Springfield or in Princeton, the county seat. It's here at home. The strength of America is at home. And this is place, a place where all of us can help select our strongest neighbors and most capable people to fill local spots and responsibilities. Then you can see them grow and blossom and elevate them then to the next position if they want to go and you be willing to help them out of your wallet and out of your work, helping them to win. And once they're elected, feed them information. Let them know why you feel as you do. We have the best system of government, but our cooperation with those elected leaders is horrible. And just, we don't vote. Just pause for a moment here and let this gentleman get by here. Yeah, just talk for Okay. Um, he became president of the Illinois Farm Bureau in 1970 and served 13 years in that capacity. And uh, you, were, uh, you were about finishing up your tenure there just as the, so we really started to see some very bad times for Illinois farmers and farmers across the country. What, what was the combination of factors that came together that, that, that saw so many of the family farms go under at that time? You have worded the question very appropriately. It was a combination of factors. First, and I don't say these necessarily in priority, but first was inflation. Inflation was rampant. Secondly was interest rates. Interest rates got up to 22%. And thirdly, we farmers paid too much for land. We just knew we had to have more land and we went out and paid for it, believing that thing, the history is going to repeat itself, but it didn't. We didn't predict, we didn't even consider a 22% increase, but it was those three factors. We paid too much, we wanted to farm too much, inflation, and then we saw interest rates reach that point. And the impact was also devastating on the farm credit uh, associations and all of the systems that uh, helped to finance through the banks and uh, the various uh, associations and the like. And your expertise was called upon in Washington and under uh, the Reagan administration and later the Bush administration because a lot of the places that made the farm loans, they started to flounder and they because the loans weren't uh, they couldn't be uh, they couldn't be paid off it was tragic I want to speak to the point in two areas the farm credit system was the blue ribbon historically the blue ribbon the champion lender of currencies monies to farmers and ranchers and the cooperatives that served them they had performed marvelously through the years. You know, they started after World War I, and their record was tremendous. They helped untold thousands of individuals and entities. <laughs> That's okay, we can live with him. Blame. As you were saying. You got to think what I was saying. Uh, they, uh, you said it was a blue ribbon system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And the farm credit system through these years would lend money to individuals based upon their ability to repay the loan. The loan was good for good, good for both parties, both the farm credit system and the individuals. But unfortunately, during the early '80s and up to the middle '80s, they started lending on a different formula. It was the wrong thing to do because that formula had to do with the quality of, not the quality of the loan, but the, the. Now I've lost my train of thought again. Um, I'll think of. I'll think of. The, I've got to think of a word. I can't think of the word right now. What do you call it when you have value of land, value of machinery? You have. Oh shoot. 
Um, collateral? Collateral, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you can cut this out. That's okay. Just the farm up. credit system then unfortunately followed a new system of collateral lending. And when the interest rates went out and land values dropped in half or more, it was tragic. The system almost failed. And the largest bank in the history of the United States, in Jackson, Mississippi, went into receivership. And that was one of the first things the Senate pointed to me when I was going through the hearings. Steele, what will you do to take the pressure off the farm credit system for the largest bank in the history of our country that's in receivership? So that was one of my first challenges. And the other challenge was this. Create an insurance company within the structure of the farm credit system to guarantee to the investor in the products and to the lender and the borrower that there's self-protection. So we did both. We took care of that bank. But I would also want to say the biggest loser was not the farm credit system. The biggest loser were these hundreds and hundreds of farmers and ranchers that went bankrupt because the loan shouldn't have been made in many, many cases. Not only the farm credit system, but also other lending agencies. They followed a system of this. Borrow as much as you can borrow. Okay, we go. All right. Well, we saw something. We saw some producer credit association shut down. Something like over 300 farm banks, or one in five banks, failed. Uh, how did, did did you ever wonder how am I going to do this? How am I going to turn this around? Yes, you did. You wondered. You also you also have faith in our system. You have to have faith when life seems to be the darkest. It's about the time you're going to see some light. The interest rates came down. Commodity prices came up. Land values, I'd mentioned, had dropped in half. So there was a historic fallout. We lost nearly a whole generation of young farmers, never to be regained. But then we started anew. And right here in my township, where I saw the top value of land, the top acres of land, sell for over $4,500, drop down, down to $1,500. Now what? Year 2000, land sell up, back up 36, 3,800 again. And we'll say, do we have sharp memories? Well, in a sense, we do. But also, this sounds like we're at an airport, but we're, we're really not. We're just spraying corn. <laughs> that's okay. We're talking on the farm, so it's gonna, there's going to be farm noise around because that's so we, where we we've are. We've got farm noise. Yeah. That means somebody's able to work, so that's, yes. that's fine. Um, you were named by President Reagan to chair the National Commission on Agricultural Finance. Uh, what, and uh, later, uh, President Bush... Uh, tapped you to head the Farm Credit Association. Um, what kind of expertise did you bring to those? What, what were the thoughts as you, you came to those positions about the kind of job you had to do? Well, I, I would want, want us to realize that Farm Bureau in Illinois, in its structure, is more than a general farm organization. It's an entity of organizations. So in addition to the president of the Illinois Farm Bureau, I was also president of an insurance corporation. I was president of a, of a funding corporation, president of several entities. So I had a background of banking there and lending. Then I served, after I left Farm Bureau in 83, I served then for a number of years uh, with a bank holding company. So I had, the, I had the background of banking, not near to the extent of the, of the volume of business of the farm credit system, but I did have that basic background, plus the administrative background. 
I inherited at the farm credit system these bureaucrats. And I smiled because I too on the farm had heard that word. The third day, Margie came out. They'd had a welcoming for me. I said, Margie, these bureaucrats, I have just met my second Farm Bureau family. I couldn't be more pleased with the dedication, with the qualifications, with the teamwork that I could envision within those minds and those eyes of those people. And that's precisely what I found in the four years. My job was to create and develop within the Farm Credit Administration, the regulator of the farm credit system, an environment whereby these people could, without fear of their positions and their dedication, what they believed into that job description called for, that they could work unfettered from outside forces. And they produced admirably. They produced so well that many of them worked themselves out of jobs and we cut back staff as certain ones retired. I was very proud. Many of them came from rural America. One came from Boston. So wherever they came from, I saw within their productivity something I was proud to be a part of. That was in the executive branch of government. We were an independent agency. What were the key changes that you made? I opened up the door so they could feel and know that I would protect them from outside interference when they were carrying out their duties as assigned. That's the primary thing that I did do. Also, I brought in some outside people. And I would say that as through the due process of interview, selecting the people that I believe were most capable and had the best background and pedigree for that position, many were women. I believed I was going to be called a womanizer. I brought in many top staff females that did such a, a marvelous job. It also, I saw, caused the men to get a lot better, called competition. When I came there, there was one woman in a top spot. When I left there, there was about six of them. And out of, out of a dozen, that's pretty close to 50%. Well, the strategy must have worked because the system stayed on, whoops. <laughs> I knew, <laughs> hang on a second. He'll run up the field there in just a little bit and we'll be all right. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Well, the strategy must have worked because the farm, system, the farm credit system stayed on its feet. Um, many of the banks stayed in business. Uh, the money that Congress was... Uh, was loaning, was paid back ahead of schedule, according to farm economists that I've talked to. Uh, so you must be very proud of what ended up happening. Yes, I am. And also, it's a series of things. We've had good crops. Prices have been very favorable. Production has been very favorable. But also, I want to say, we did bring in that insurance company to fruition. And in the last report that I received, they're up to full base amount. And they have a a billion four hundred million dollars to protect the investors in the farm credit system funds. And the strategy must still be working too because as we know the farm prices are in pretty bad shape at the moment and we're not hearing of all the foreclosures and all the people going out of business like we had back in the 1980s. No, that's right. And hopefully we'll be able to make some adjustments to the area that I mentioned early on this interview that farmers will find a way to to adjust to this great change that we're seeing in the structure of agriculture. Why have farm prices fallen so much recently? Supply is one factor but that's not the only factor. In the pork industry 
we saw live hog prices in December of 1998 at $8 per hundred. When it cost at that time $42 per hundred, you can see that many efficient producers lose everything. And to me, it was an adjustment of several factors. One, they say, is not enough capacity at the processing plant. I believe there are many other things, too, leading up to this that I can't even expect to know. Many researchers said we can't discover all the reasons for it, uh, albeit a year later we were slaughtering more and the price was up in the 30s. So this tells me that we, were, we as farmers were not given the facts when hogs were $8. We were given a story of untruths and partial facts. And the Asian financial crisis also uh, had its impact on uh, the American farm economy because they couldn't buy as many commodities as, as they were buying. That's true. And also the European community was developed and they had a strategy, self-sufficiency. And Asia, uh, excuse me, Europe was our largest buyer back in the late 70s, early 80s. They were number one. Then Japan came in and other Pacific Rim countries came in and as you say the, ec the economies that are there that they cut back buying but we've lost other good buyers for other reasons and now we're seeing another change and that's called South America where there are tremendous tremendous acreages particularly in Brazil that are being developed and they are not burning down Rainforest. They're dragging out scrub bushes, scrub trees. We've not been given a true story on that one either. And they're going to just produce so many soybeans and corn that we're going to have to look at a whole new challenge. They're developing waterways, uh, transition systems for movement of grain and soybeans, um, and uh, they're, they're going to be tough competition. They are right now. They're going to get more tough. How does the American farmer compete in a global economy like that? Particularly when we see so many differences under which the farmer producers in these various countries are having to operate. Compare. We've talked about Brazil. Here in Illinois, we have regulations for environmental purposes. We have regulations on clean water, regulations on clean air. We have high tax responsibilities and very high land prices against a society that has very few regulations, if any, where prices that they pay for many ingredients for the tools of production are 60% what we pay, where land prices and labor is much less and machinery is less to pay for. So this makes for a very interesting answer to the question you raise. How are we going to perform in the future? And that's one of the primary questions that has to be decided, determined. For instance, we believe as farmers that the consuming public absolutely must feel comfortable that the food that they buy is pure that they can depend upon it. And so we have standards of production to say, yes, you can be sure that it's, it's that way. Now we're seeing many foods flown in, goes to the market, that do not come under the same standards. Our son was in, a member of the Illinois Ag Leadership Foundation uh, two years ago, three years ago, excuse me, South America. And he said, you know, down there, human waste is used for fertilizer, grow grapes, or grow sweet corn, or grow other food. So I'm looking at the label now, and here I see some nice, good looking fruit. And here's where it came from, right where they use this material. I said, I'm going to leave it on the shelf. 
But how many people will know this? And why in the world, why in the world do we permit it to happen? If we, if, look, if these regulators that we have are so interested in the consuming public, then why does their interest fail to point zero when the product comes in? That tells me that's really not their main concern as a consumer. It's more of their concern what's going on at home. With little, little concern of the imported quality. I think it's two standards. And they're talking out of two sides of their face. That's bad. And you think Congress should be more accountable on that? And how does Congress know this? From we the people. We need to tell them so they will know. But you know, they can't do everything. They can't teach our kids in school. Congress can't do everything. It's got to be here at home. When we render out the facts, then we need to put on the platter the facts for our members of Congress and say, here is a problem, here should be a solution. Please think about it. Think of the consequences. You know a broader picture, but here's what we see and here are the facts. And we have searched them and researched them very carefully. And we've got our own regulatory issues here that we have to deal with as well. We have, I just uh, sat through about three years of debate in Springfield on uh, large uh, livestock farms and the regulations that uh, go to them. There's discussions also of uh, what we should do with bioengineered crops and so many things on the board. How do you keep it all straight? <laughs> you, know, you know, Margie and I were over in Africa a year ago, July. We had American Field Service daughter from Holland she had dedicated four years in Africa as an animal scientist to increase the domestic livestock for human consumption for, Af for Kenya and Ethiopia. And Aka showed us several things going on in Africa and introduced us to some people. And as we talked, here's a country where 48% unemployment Here's a country where there's hungry people. Here's a country that wants to raise their standards and can't really accomplish it. What can we do? And they're talking about the very subject you just brought up. Biotechnology. It must be bad. Well, I heard the former Secretary of Agriculture, Jack Block. John Block. I thought he made a tremendous statement. He said, you know, those people that are complaining about genetically engineered products to food and they're probably eating seedless grapes when they're making these detrimental products. He said, comments, where do you suppose the seedless grapes come? God didn't make seedless grapes, man did. Now I think that's one more good example of fact. Seedless grapes haven't hurt anyone since they were developed. Seedless watermelons likewise. These new developed crops were developed to increase productivity and much of the research, all the research that I've ever seen, shows that it's absolutely good and clean and helpful. What do you think about the, uh, the uh, technological changes where you can sit down and look at satellite plots of your, of your fields to see which area is getting uh, more moisture than the others and where things are coming, where some crops are growing ahead of others. Uh, it's fantastic what you're able to do with the global positioning satellites and the whole bit. I'm going to have to go to school this summer. Son Greg bought a new combine, and it has global positioning characteristics about it. So Greg and grandson Chris and I are going to go to school. So this fall, when I'm permitted to use this machine, we'll be able to know within six square feet the yield per acre, the moisture content, and the exact location in that field, every six feet in that whole field. Then you could take this information, plug it into a fertilizer applying machine when you put on nutrients for the next crop, and it will apply what's needed. Efficiency? Tremendous. When I leave that field also with that machine, I'll know the exact yield per acre, 
and what the moisture content was. Boom. Once I know how to push the buttons. Now, I just think this is fantastic. When I was in Washington, back in, oh, I suppose, around 1992, I happened to be riding with a uniform man in, in, in service. He said, I can freely tell you now because it's no longer a secret. We have been working on a technology of global positioning. And I thought, what does that mean? He said, with this little machine you can have in your pocket or fastened to your belt, you'll know on planet Earth within eight or ten feet exactly where you are. Isn't this fantastic? I said, it sure is fantastic. I said, you mean I could be out in the jungle and know where I was and how to get what? He said, yes. Little did I imagine how this would be applied to agriculture to the benefit of all the consumers. It is, it is just a wonderful thing to help our environment, to help production, to help everything. Technology that came from our armed forces that they needed in creating the kind of safety net that they needed for their pilots and other people. I don't say war is good. But I say there's a lot of fallout from war when it's necessary that does help the civilian situation. Despite all the challenges and in, in the, the hurdles that face farmers in these days, you seem pretty optimistic about the future. You have to be an optimist to be a farmer. And I don't say that frivolously or lightly, but I say it, first, you believe. I believe in God the Creator. I believe so much in our Constitution. I believe so much in our system. There's not another system like it. Of all of the constitutions of all the nations in the world, there are many, many comparisons, like the word freedom, like the word responsibility. But in our Constitution, there's three words that none of them have. We the people. And I believe if I do my best, and you do your best, then we will all have the best. That's sort of been the philosophy since I came back to the farm. I'm sure it was a philosophy that I grew up with in the kitchen when mom and dad talked. You know, that's really where we met in the kitchen, around the table. And when the neighbors come, they always come to the back door. They don't come to the front door. Just the strangers come to the front door. It's we, the people, we have the best system, but we can also lose it if I don't do my best. That's the reason I'm an optimist. I believe the American people, when it comes to push, are there. I believe when you're up to the storm door and it looks like tomorrow is going to be impossible, your neighbors are there. You know, out here on the farm, when it came spring plowing or spring planting or harvest, if I'm in the hospital, all the neighbors come. You help one another. In early America, when a lightning hit your barn and burned it down, all the neighbors came for a barn raising. It's still here in agriculture. We help one another. And my wife's from the city. Once I got to know her family, I saw within them the same thing. There in the city, there's that same quality and determination. When somebody's down, you're going to be there to help them. And I believe that's true with our society. In America, if you have faith in the system, if you have faith that people are going to invest, if you have faith that people are going to buy for the food tomorrow, you can have be sure that you're going to have a, a place to sell your product as a farmer. It used to be that I could give eggs to the neighbor <laughs> or sell them for a nickel anymore with regulations. 
I can't do that legally because they say I can't. But we've adjusted to some of those things. I think we're on a good point to end. Mr. Steele, thanks very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate the, your sharing your story with us. Well, I'm glad that you've been here on this beautiful day in June where the sun rays are warm, where the water has nurtured this new crop. We happen to be in an area that's not flooded. We happen to be in an area that's not parched. And both of those conditions are within a few hundred miles. But you're here at a time when you and I can talk about the basics of our society and to and about Abraham Lincoln who created within his own virtues as a human honesty, integrity, a will to win, to lose an election or two or three or four elections, but to win the presidency. And as president, the most difficult time of any president. Our nation was 85 years old when 12 states seceded. It wasn't just slavery. It wasn't just economics. But Abraham Lincoln says, this nation, the last great hope of planet Earth, must be saved. He too believed in the American people. He too believed that a will to win was essential when the chips were down. Today, he's recognized and honored and revered, not only in the United States, but around the world. I'm fortunate to be a citizen of a country where Abraham Lincoln was one of those great leaders. We all are. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We need to sit here for just a second and so we can get some uh, tape to roll the credits over. Thank you very much. Well, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. You see, when you're, when you're talking to the fellows down at the coffee shop, they won't sit and listen like you have. They, <laughs> they'll turn you off in two minutes and say, that's enough still. I've, that's more than I want to know. <laughs> well, I appreciate it so much. Uh, How are we doing? Great. Okay. All righty. Hello.